uh, after some more uh, <laughs> of the carbon thrust of uh, people expressing their views on these important questions to do with charity and public benefit. This panel uh, is made up of Andrew Phillips, Sue Barker, and Parrish in their biographies are in your program. I invite you to look at them at your leisure. Uh, Adam and Sue, I think they're going to be all Adam, perhaps not. Um, the topic for this panel is charity advocacy. There is no other topic in charity law today, and uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion. So, um, remind me of the order here, guys. Is Adam going to kick off? Yes. So, we'll hear from Adam first, um, and then Andrew, and then Sue, and then we'll open up for questions. And I think we'll um, just take a shorter afternoon tea because I don't want this discussion to come. All right, can you uh, just indicate if you can hear me, Alkern? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I, I can see, and what I see is about a 10-foot image of my head, so I apologize. <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope that's not in high definition. Um, I, I won't turn my computer screen because tonight I'm being a Canadian stereotype and I have the hockey game on, which would normally be unprofessional, but it's a Game 7 elimination, so... Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm going to focus my uh, time, and I, I've been told to speak for about 10 minutes, I'm going to focus my time on the uh, public awareness facet of, of advocacy, and just by way of some very uh, brief background, uh, it will be known to most of you, but not all of you, that restrictions on advocacy and charity law uh, emerge from a doctrine of political purposes, and that doctrine uh, encapsulates and captures as political and thus non-charitable a, a mix of unlike things, which include um, partisan participation in, a, in electoral politics, uh, campaigning for law uh, and policy reform. Um, and I'm not going to talk about those, not because they're not worthy of talking about, um, but because there's something that differentiates those from what I do want to talk about, which is public awareness that stops short of, of those things, that stops short of campaigning for law reform, that stops short of electoral politics. And so I'm going to, I'm going to dub that public awareness uh, and say a few things about that. And the reason I want to talk about that is because it's unlike those other things. It's non-episodic. Um, uh, charities are, are almost constantly engaging in some form of public awareness. And so the, the practical consequences of, of regulatory overreach here are potentially severe. Um, and so I want to devote some time uh, to that. And I'll organize my thoughts into two, two categories that correspond with my own background. As prior to becoming an academic, I was a lawyer, um, actually advising clients. Um, and now that I'm an academic, I don't advise clients as much, but I do take positions on the law. So I'm going to offer some input for practitioners, and then also some input that might help frame policy um, and, and criticism. And, and, and I think also planning comes out of criticism. But I'll begin with a few thoughts for um, practitioners, and there's one point that's become quite clear, is that the authorities are, are casting a cloud of suspicion on the charitableness of public awareness. Um, we certainly saw that in, in the Greenpeace decision, um, uh, which in, on one read of it actually says that public awareness might be the only remaining category of, of, of political activity or political purpose. But there's also some Canadian cases that have been cited in New Zealand law uh, for the proposition that promoting a point of view is political, and that would be the Human Life International decision, another decision called Positive Action Against Pornography. Um, there's also some recent decisions of the Charities Registration Board um, that speak squarely to this, one of which was the Save Animals from Exploitation um, uh, decision, which actually, um, I've got it in front of me, actually concluded is that the board considers this advocacy, referring to uh, animal welfare public awareness, provides on balance a public benefit, and thus was charitable. Um, that contrasts with the Greenpeace commentary, uh, the decision re released March 21st, just last month, that came to the conclusion that the public awareness uh, wasn't charitable, um, for, for several reasons, at least one of which is it couldn't be found to have public benefit. Um, and there's also the Family First uh, decision uh, released in August, which also took a, a more restrictive approach on public awareness, concluding that while advancing a philosophical or ethical system might be charitable, advancing a, a, a view on a single issue from an ethical perspective is not. That's not charitable public awareness. Okay, and so that's a little bit of context. 
what is it that practitioners are supposed to do with this body of law to advise their clients? And how can clients, how can charities stay on the right side of the regulator? And of course, a, a cynical expression, but, but I do say this with some sincerity, is that the, the key for charities is to advocate without the pretense of being an advocate. Um, <laughs> And the question is, is how do you do that? And here are a few thoughts that I tease out from the authorities as food for thought. Public awareness to, to avoid the label political or non-charitable should be dressed with uh, indicia of objectivity uh, or indicia of, of rigor. And one of, the, um, one of the constant themes or recurrent themes in the authorities from the Charities Registration Board, from courts, from my own regulator in Canada, the Canada Revenue Agency, one of the constant critiques of non-charitable public awareness is that it's subjective, that it, it's, it's partisan, that it merely just posits a claim um, and then thus can't be found to be public benefit. That it might be right, it might be wrong, the perspective might be helpful, it might be harmful, but it's just a, a series of positive claims and that's why it's not charitable. And one way to overcome that objection then is to link conclusions with peer-reviewed research. And there is some suggestion in the authorities that that, that does potentially take you out of the non-charitable uh, count. So, it's, so you need to address the, the public awareness with indicia of objectivity. Um, that includes citing peer-reviewed research. I think that would include acknowledging the complexity of the issue. If you read the Charity Registration Board's decision in Greenpeace, there is several times, where there's three or four paragraphs where I say this is a complex issue. This is a complex issue, with the implication being that Greenpeace was oversimplifying the issue by just simply positing an answer as the only conceivable answer, not recognizing the complexity of the issues um, at hand. Um, there are also some authorities that say, if you don't acknowledge competing perspectives, that this puts you into the political camp. So viewing that can be helpful. And I would add to that list, and I'm not sure if this has been tested, though, um, that I think broadcasting that you're self-aware of your positionality, that you're, you're taking a position and advancing a position whilst acknowledging that this is just a position among others. And I think that might actually also be a helpful thing. Um, we've seen also as another practical tip that comes out of the Human Dignity Trust decision that if you can invoke human rights in your advocacy, even if it doesn't actually change the substance of what you're advocating, it actually puts you into a different frame of thought from a regulator or court's perspective. And so to the extent that you can do this, um, it's a helpful thing and we can, we can talk about that. I mean, I think the other single biggest advice would be avoid single issue advocacy. Avoid single issue advocacy. This, this came up very clear in the Family First decision of the Charities Registration Board, that if you advance an ethical system, that's conceivably charitable. But if you advance an issue on a single topic from an ethical perspective, for better or for worse, it's going to come under scrutiny. Um, and so those are some practical advice. And, and, and there are a few minutes I've got left. Let me also just add some policy considerations as, as, as a little bit of conversation framing here that goes beyond everything I just said might on some level be perceived as cynical, but I think it's just what lawyers do. We, we, we take reasons for judgment, reasons for decisions as cues as to how to navigate our way uh, on the right side of the law. But as academics, as policymakers, um, I think we're obliged to stand back from this and ask some more difficult questions. And it, it seems to me that one of the significant problems at play here is a mistake about public benefit analysis. Um, and, and I say this with, with respect, with greatest of respect. Um, but one point really struck me in the Greenpeace decision. I'm going to read a sentence. It says, the board accepts that Greenpeace's advocacy is for the charitable end goal of protecting the environment. They accepted that. You are, you are operating for, the, for a charitable purpose. And yet somehow they managed to conclude that the public awareness was non-charitable because it lacked public benefit or couldn't be found. They didn't say it lacked it, but they said it couldn't be found to possess it, which is probably a different formulation of the same perspective. And I mention that for this reason. Activities under the common law of charity aren't typically vetted for public benefit. Purposes are vetted for public benefit. So once, once you get the check on the, there's a charitable purpose at play here, 
you necessarily have the public benefit to that. The only remaining question is, is does the activity further a charitable purpose? And so if public awareness is not charitable, the reason has to be because the link between that activity, the activity of public awareness, and the charitable end goal gets severed somewhere along the way. Okay, and that, that question actually just never gets taken up. And so I think what's going on here is a confusion of activities and purposes uh, that seems to be quite a prolific problem throughout the, the entire Commonwealth. Um, the other comment I'll make very quickly is part of also what's going on in this area of law is that all charitable speech at some level, this is a bit of hyperbole in what I'm saying, but, but I'll, I'll make the hyperbolized point for a point. Charitable speech is being held up to the standards of education. Again, this is very clear in the Charity Registration Board, Board's decision in Greenpeace, where if you track through the reasons for why Greenpeace's public awareness was held not to be for the advancement of education, they actually parallel all of the same reasons for why public awareness wasn't charitable. And so what you find coming out of this is that the requirements for education, the strict requirements to be under the head of education, are then being used as minimum regulatory standards for charitable speech. And I'm not sure that's right with respect. That would, that, and so I'll ask you a question. Is, would we conclude that charitable speech is non-charitable because it's not religious? And I don't think that we would, so I'm not sure why we would include, conclude that public awareness is not charitable because it's not educational. It doesn't have to be. It's not for the advancement of education, arguably. Um, and the final comment from a, from a more policy perspective, is this area causes me a little bit of concern uh, as an analyst from this lens. I get the sense that um, um, this that the outcomes seem to privilege, and I don't think it's intentional, but the outcomes seem to privilege some speech relative to others for reasons that aren't um, obvious. Um, there's this quote from the board's decision in Family First. The courts have generally not found public benefit in the advocacy cases which involve promoting a particular point of view underpinned by moral philosophies. And I can accept that as a statement of, of law, and let's just accept that that's correct. Um, but when we come to the save, the save animals from exploitation, we end up getting um, a moral perspective on animals, uh, on, uh, animal, on, on animal cruelty, that's recognized as charitable. And it's not really explained what differentiates the advocacy um, in my mind, anyway, it's not explained what differentiates the advocacy in connection with save animals from exploitation from family first. Now, this is a very different ethical perspective, but why is one ethical perspective on the right side of the regulatory line and the other one's on the wrong, on the wrong side of it? There is a, in both instances, an ethical perspective being drawn on to advance debate on a controversial topic. Why is one in one is pointed out? And I think that's a, that's a good question to ask, accepting that there may be a plausible answer, but it's a good question to ask. And so I'm sorry, I spoke for 12 minutes, but uh, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks, Debbie. Well, I said four to 12 minutes anyway. Um, Andrew, would you like to come? Thank you. Do you ask? Um, I really appreciate being here. Also, I recognize I'm somewhat wearing the um, bad guy hat as I'm going to go and talking about the regulators' um, approach. Um, I just wanted to quickly on thank Sue and Stephen for doing a lot of energy into making this happen. I've got a event like this would happen for all five years I've been working for charity services, so it's really exciting to be involved in it now. Um, so I'm going to issue the same kind of disclaimer that um, Peter did. These observations are not made on behalf of departments, they're not made on behalf of the Charity Registration Board. They are my own, although they are based on um, basically assessing a number of applications and investigations of my time charity services. Um, I also want to be um, direct talking in detail or answering questions about current open cases as you understand why. Um, first, just want to make a quick distinction here. I think Adam um, did a pretty good job of that. But um, when we're talking about advocacy, I'm talking about 
charities advocating to decision makers, government, policy makers, the public, all the point of view on an issue. Um, that's both the public awareness side of things that I was talking about, as well as the, the direct trying to change the law. I will keep the law the same. Um, that's because the law doesn't distinguish those two, past the Greenpeace Supreme Court decision. Um, I'm, I'm not talking about organisations like community law centres and uh, system by bureaus providing personal advocacy for individuals, um, or organisations that provide their expertise or objective evidence to decision makers. Um, so, a little bit of uh, history here for, for those who may not be um, fully aware of, of how this went. In, in 2014, Terry Sosis and the board were faced with the first decision of the Supreme Court, which changed the way advocacy was treated. Once the first decision of the Supreme Court, I mean, on um, charities issues. Um, previously, before the Supreme Court decision, there was a bar on controversial political purposes. That was the position of the Court of Appeal and various cases. The purpose was to change the law or change policy or try and keep the law the same, then you are not charitable. Um, even if you argue that your point of view advances the um, charitable end goal. Um, the Supreme Court, by a majority 3 2 decision, lifted that bar on controversial political purposes. Or, in fact, it said that the Court of Appeal was wrong in thinking it was one there to begin with. Instead, it explained that the density has a purpose to advocate for a cause, the assessment should focus on whether it advances the public benefit consistent with the previous cases. Um, particularly, said you have to look at the end goal of the cause, um, see whether that's charitable, but also the means the policy is promoted by the, the charity and the manner of advocacy it was using. It also confirmed that we have to look for analogies in previous cases when determining whether a purpose was for the public benefit in a charitable sense. Um, to apply the test, the Supreme Court assessed how the Court of Appeal has assessed new bill of disarmaments. Um, the Court of Appeal accepted that a purpose to um, promote new bill of disarmament was charitable, um, basically because it was now widely accepted in New Zealand society. Um, the Supreme Court rejected that concept. It said that even if it's widely accepted or if it's controversial, it won't be automatically out. Um, and instead, it focused on how the charity was advancing its purpose to promote new bill of disarmament. Um, it goes deep into the specifics. It looks at the way the Supreme Court opposed nuclear disarmament. It looks at the Supreme opposition to the nuclear non proliferation treaty because it allows nuclear power, which the Supreme Court opposes. Um, the court thought that advocating for such a policy in such a way couldn't be seen to be for the benefit of the public, thinking about all the consequences domestic and international in New Zealand to adopt that position. This means um, and this, this is now the law in New Zealand. This means in considering organisations that advocate for the main purpose, we have to do the same exercise. We have to look at how the policies they support, balance the consequences of the policies, see if they can advance the public benefit consistent with the previous charities case. Um, in its dissenting judgment, the minority um, noted using the majority approach would probably result in the same kind of difficulties finding public benefits in environmental causes as the Court of Appeals approach. And that's been the case. Um, the board eventually declined Greenpeace as it couldn't find public benefit in all advocacy. Although the end goal was similar to what previously been accepted as charitable, protecting the environment, many of the policies advocated for were difficult to determine to be for the public benefit. Um, that being said, the Supreme Court decision has involved more charities being registered. The board has registered a number of groups that advance advocacy purposes since Greenpeace. Um, as an all-charitable purpose, it's a balancing exercise between um, the public benefits that can stand in similar previous cases and non charitable purposes like the promotion of a first opinion on the matter. Um, an example was advocating for a new strategic plan for strictly that encompassed a wide range of stakeholder viewpoints. Um, and now it's time to charitable part of the organisers who developed the plan were a bit too advanced in how they went about it. Some of those points that Adam made were very um, accurate in determining the kind of things that we'll look at when trying to find public benefits. Um, also advocating certain professors on animal welfare was recently determined as charitable was consistent to what was previously accepted as charitable in, in charities law cases. That was the direction of the Supreme Court and that's what we applied. Um, the key is looking at how a charity is advocating, what its policies are, and ultimately can the policy be seen to advance a public manifest behind the charitable purpose. Not everything that has charitable ends will necessarily benefit the public in a charitable sense. An example 
Um, although the World Health Organization is say that most um, cities have air pollution that doesn't meet human health standards, it would be unlikely that banning all cars could be seen to benefit the public in a charitable sense. Um, in practice, we recognize this is a difficult question for charities to discuss when they want to engage in a cause to support a charitable purpose. And we understand this is a challenge for groups to do what is best for their communities. I've said this on a blog a few times, and I open it up again, like, do we recognize this as part and we want to talk to charities to try and help them understand the limits? And we're happy to do that. And we're happy to do that on an anonymous basis if they're worried about us coming after them. So that, I open that invitation up. Um, it's also important to note that it didn't change another fundamental, uh, um, fundamental principle of charitable purpose. Charities can engage in non charitable purposes if they're ancillary to their main purposes. So this is for the church advocating on moral issues or a food bank um, supporting anti poverty measures. Um, as we'll get today, there are alternatives. As you've already heard today, there are alternatives to the approach of the Supreme Court. Um, so there are some other countries with similar approaches to charities, such as Australia and the United States. Ban electioneering or association with political parties, otherwise accept advocating for a point of view. Um, in practice, the Biden bill this could mean more lobby groups could be charitable. The literature talks a lot about charity representing marginalised and other issues for people in need, but as has been traversed already, charity goes beyond the traditional understanding of the word. Advancing religion, industry, and commerce can be charitable purposes, and so lobbying with those end goals could potentially end up as charitable. In um, some cases, they're set to relieve the public of taxes as charitable, and so potentially a group that advocates for lower taxes could qualify. Um, we have a case coming up in New Zealand, um, which we're moving everywhere, for deciding um, whether advocacy of moral improvement is charitable, uh, which could mean that any group that says it's trying to improve people's morals willing to its use could be charitable. Um, the electioneering approach, so just, um, just focusing on whether they're engaged with a political party, could result in murky territory. Most political parties will say their purposes include the relief of poverty, advancement of education, and promotion of health. Even though banning electioneering itself, the distinction between a political party and a charity can be a lot thinner when more of its groups are accepted as charitable. There is nothing principally wrong with this, but personally I wonder if that would impact on the public trust in charities as a whole if most lobby groups accepted access the same benefits that charities do. Um, in the end of the day, the charitable tax benefits received by charities mean we all pay from charities. And if donors to lobby groups get significant tax benefits, does this have the potential for influencing the political landscape where it's not necessarily positive? Advocacy continues to be an issue for all regulators in some form of shape or form internationally. In preparing for this, I saw articles from Ireland, Australia, and the United States discussing various limitations, and they can't see that changing. Whether it's best to focus on public benefit of policies, the charities are supporting or have policy out political parties. There are always going to be contentious lines. The academic literature talks a lot about rethinking how we think about charity. Maybe that would be um, useful, from, but from my view, we just need a straight forward test that balances those fiscal considerations, public trust and confidence, and promoting a healthy democracy. And from my thinking, the Supreme Court's approach does appear to strike that balance. Thank you. It's a great favour of coming just under time for us as well, so thank you for that too. Um, Sue, would you like to run? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, agree with the points that Adam Carrington has made, that there is a confusion of services and activities and that the Supreme Court appears to have limited what might be referred to as a political purpose exclusion to only the level of public awareness raising. I'd just like to reflect on the point that Andrew made about whether we, do have, we did have a political purpose exclusion in New Zealand or prior to um, the Charities Act coming into force. I would argue that we did not. Um, the case of Malloy is always cited. The Malloy case is a 1981 case where Mrs. Malloy made a $5 donation to SPUC, the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child. The Court of Appeal, it was actually about donor status, and the Court of Appeal said that she couldn't have her tax um, deduction for making that donation because the court couldn't tell whether the purposes of SPUC were for, uh, they thought they were political. They couldn't find them as being for the public benefit. Um, 
and uh, they use the word political and they cited Bowman. And that is the case that is normally held up as evidencing that we had a political purposes exclusion in New Zealand law. But what bothers me about that analysis is that in reaching that conclusion, the other cases are cited. For example, the case of the Court of Appeal in Latimer, 2000. In that case, the Court of Appeal held that the purpose of the Crown Forestry Rental Trust and assisting Māori to bring claims before the Waitangi Tribunal was charitable. It did so on the basis of the evidence before the court uh, that the treaty settlement process was for the benefit of our society and not political, even though it always ends in an act of parliament and it was highly charged and in some respects we are now in a post-settlement phase perhaps, but it was nevertheless highly charged, controversial, political. So if you actually analyse those cases together, I don't think you can say that we had a political person's exclusion in our law. What we had was a term, political, which is code for, well, we couldn't see the public benefit on the facts of that case. And the real problem with this case is that under that, that, those cases, Malloy and Latimer, charities had the advantage of having a full oral hearing of evidence. And I could almost feel Andrew's eyes roll when I say that, but <laughs> we did. Charities went to court, they called their witnesses, they um, brought their experts, they brought their expert evidence, IRD cross-examined them, they got to cross-examine IRD. So the court had before them uh, all this evidence on which they could determine whether or not there was public benefit. And I think what's really important in that context is the Court of Appeal specifically acknowledged that the fact that Parliament had made so much um, involved, it had so much involvement in the treaty settlement process, setting up the Waitangi Tribunal, all these various, um, the, basically the conclusion was that the involvement of Parliament can be evidence of public benefit. And I think that's particularly relevant in the context of social housing, because not only did part of the government pay the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust six million dollar tax bill with uh, taxpayers' money, it also spent no, uh, however many thousands of dollars amending the law to give them their own specific tax exemption. Now I used to work in tax policy, broad based low rate. You do not get your own tax exemption. That is a massive achievement. Does that not necessarily, or does that not indicate that Parliament thought the purposes of the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust were for the public benefit? But the problem is the Charities Bill um, was introduced into Parliament in 2004 and it was fundamentally flawed. And I don't think anyone who was there, that was, it was. <laughs> it was almost completely rewritten at Select Committee stage. But the changes that were made at Select Committee stage were not subject to proper consultation. But the deal was, so Michael Cullen, Minister of Finance, don't worry about a charitable sector, we'll give it a post implementation review, let's just try and see. Now, advocacy was the key issue facing um, the most of the raised in these submissions. 753 submissions, um, some of them from charities representing thousands of New Zealand charities. Um, advocacy is the key issue. And that's where we get into five, section 5B, and I, I don't want to get into that. It's great to talk about it, but in the interest of time, um, the key issue for current purposes is that the original appeal was to the district court. The district court gives you a full period of evidence, which is exactly what they had under the previous regime under the tax administration. Full period of evidence, so we can work out whether these purposes operate for the public benefit or not. But the district the court appeal was made final. So a charity can go to the district court and that's it. Of course, the minister said, well, the definition of charitable purpose resides in the current common law. Uh, charities should at least have the ability to appeal to the highest court in the land. Um, and these areas of trust were, were often more uh, considered by the High Court than the District Court. So the first select me said, OK, all right, cross out the word district, made the word high. So now the appeal is to the High Court, but otherwise not changed. Now that might seem good on its face, but the problem is that appeals to the High Court are not conducted as all hearings on the evidence. They are conducted on the basis of an appeal on the record. The High Court appeal assumes that you've already had an oral hearing of evidence in the, in the tribunal below. But the problem is, the board does not conduct an oral hearing of evidence. 
So our charity is under the Charities Act for trying to demonstrate that their purposes operate for the public benefit without any of the systems that our uh, law provides for determining questions of fact. Now, when I was the young lawyer at Brown Law, and Peter was there when I was there, I remember Barbara called the state to me, these cases are one law for their facts. It's about the evidence. And charities don't have it. They don't have it in our law. And I think it's causing our law to become distorted. I think uh, the Bruce Star Lakes Community Housing Trust, if they could have had a proper hearing of evidence, of course we would have shown that that community would benefit from the people who are there. It's a tourist town. It's a tourist town. Um, that the people who clean the toilets, make the coffees, they can't afford to live there. I haven't been to Aspen, but I understand it's been like that. It's like only the rich people come, the houses are empty because they're used to the forte home. That community needs those people to live in that community, not to not to community around to Congo, to live in that community. And I, I think it's, um, I really worry about the effects of these decisions and the impact that they are having on our charitable sector and in particular our social capital. And the other point that hasn't been raised is that the um, Greenpeace decision, is, uh, the Supreme Court decision in Greenpeace, was considered by the High Court in the most recent case decided under the Charities Act, in the Foundation uh, for Anti Aging Research case. And um, uh, there are lots of issues with our Charities Act, but one of them is Section 18.3, which says that the um, charity services must have regard to the activities. Uh, and considering an application for registration. But the real problem with this is that Section 18.3 does not say what charity services are supposed to have regard to activities for. Section 13 of the Charities Act says you are eligible for registration if your purposes are charitable. It is purposes that must be charitable, not activities. Activities must be carried out in furtherance for charitable purposes. And there's some really good um, case law from Canada describing that, uh, for example, a letter writing activity. If you're writing letters to support an uh, dance school, well, that might be charitable. But if you're writing letters that contain hate speech to do whatever, well, that's obviously not. But the, 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 the activity of letter writing makes no sense unless you actually look to the purpose in which it is being carried out. The purpose of which it's being carried out. Um, so the other, Justice Alice, who we'll be speaking tomorrow, uh, looked at the Supreme Court uh, decision in Greenpeace and said, well, <coughs> it's not supposed to reach some fundamental change in the purposes focus of the inquiry. And just as Alice said, the test is, are the stated purposes charitable? If so, um, then when you look at uh, activities under Section 18.3, the issue is, are the activities carried out in furtherance of that purpose? If so, then there is no difficulty. Now the board and um, the board, the Charities Commission in the Greenpeace uh, case originally accepted Greenpeace's purpose of protecting the environment as charitable. Their purpose of protecting the environment was not an issue in the litigation. It was, uh, the issue in the litigation was their purpose of uh, the promotion of settlement and peace. So having accepted that the purpose of protecting the environment is charitable, and all activities of Greenpeace are carried out in furtherance of that purpose. On the um, law as set out by Justice Ellis in the Foundation for Aging Research case, there is no difficulty. Greenpeace should be registered. And I think, um, uh, in this big red screen now, <laughs> I'd like to make two final points, I'll make them as quickly as I can. Uh, in Australia, um, the High Court decision in AIDWatch Said, um, and I'm correct if I'm wrong, um, that the generation of public debate is itself in the public interest and a participative democracy like Australia and like New Zealand. I mean, that, but, but you know, we're the same effectively. Um, and they thought that that was so helpful, but Australia enshrines that in their law. It is the generation of public debate is in the public interest in itself. And I think in New Zealand, where we have Section 14 of the Bill of Rights Act, and the right to freedom of expression, that we really need to consider whether, whether this law is respectful of um, a, museum, a charity's right to freedom of expression. It, it, in my view, if you're freedom of deregistration because you are um, advocating for your charitable purposes, then I think we really need to look at how that is consistent with charity's rights to freedom of expression. 